Okay, ladies and gentlemen, delighted to welcome you on behalf of the Prime Minister to this session where we're really going to drill down uh, and talk about um, what, we use, what we can do um, for the victims, that they, as they used to be called. Um, it's now become the term survivor, but I prefer warrior or heroes because uh, these are the people that have been brave enough um, to speak out and in doing so have actually started to change the world. And I feel, I don't know about you, but just sitting in the plenary session uh, earlier, I really felt as though we were at the seat of the table of a paradigm change and things, this revolution really is underway. Uh, so fittingly, one of the leaders of this revolution, the warrior, Leila Hussein is going to introduce um, what we, or set out what we try, try to achieve uh, over the next 50 minutes. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. There are some headphones, uh, Channel 2 for French, Channel 1 for English, and uh, we have to be very strict on time. So um, without further ado, I want to uh, hand, introduce you to the warrior, the campaigner, uh, counsellor, and award-winning filmmaker, Leila Hussein. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I would like to thank DFID and UNICEF for organising such an important event. And for me, after nearly 12 years of campaigning against FGM, this is actually a, very, it's a historical moment, I think. And I think, and I'm very proud that in the UK we've taken this step. So I'm very proud British today. Um, just to tell you quickly about what I do in my work, and I've been a champion of I've been a champion of making sure that we break the cycle of shame. And this brings me into my role as a psychotherapist. For many years, women like myself didn't have safe spaces where they could go and talk about the horrors that they've faced as children. And it was my mission to set up the first uh, counselling service for FGM survivors. And we are the only one in the whole of Europe. And we are based in North London. Yay! So this has been... Um, the, the outcome of these uh, uh, sessions has been make, uh, we've had uh, women who, after attending our clinics for many, many weeks have used their, their uh, experience as a way of preventing other girls from being cut. So it's not just counselling work that we're doing, but we're actually preventing the next generation to be cut. So it's not just women just sitting around and chatting all day. That's not what we do. Um, one of the things I, that is uh, my aim at the moment is to have the first shelter in the UK because we don't have shelters where girls who are trying to escape FGM and they don't have spaces to go. So really that's been my key area. And also I want everybody to remember FGM is a universal issue. It's not something that's happening out there in Africa. It's happening right here in the UK and there's a big link between the diaspora community and the community back home. My mission has been to break the cycle with my daughter. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm the granddaughter of a woman who survived, survived child marriage. I'm the daughter of a woman who survived FGM. I'm very proud to be a mother to a daughter who's now, who's now protected from all forms of harm. And that happened because of the safe space I was offered as a survivor of FGM. And the reason I use the word survivor, because of what women who've gone through FGM endure. We are lucky that we didn't die, so we did survive. So it's my role and my mission to make sure no other girl ever goes through this uh, practice. So my motto has been, you save one girl, you save a whole generation. Thank you. Leila, thank you so much. I've introduced uh, Leila over the last few years several times, and each time the honour gets greater. And we really appreciate everything that you've done and are doing. Uh, so we've got some fantastic speakers to give a real insight into what's going on in terms of uh, supporting our survivors, our heroes, whatever you prefer to call them. Um, and um, without further ado, um, Leila mentioned the aim is to get a shelter. So we need to hear from Refuge, uh, because they've been providing accommodation on a national level for uh, survivors of FGM and forced marriage. Uh, so let's hear from Isabel Sherlaw from Refuge. Good morning. It's an honor to be here today in such distinguished company. Every speaker today has a microphone. 
we know that it's important that we can hear them. But who hears Alexandra forced into marriage by her father and into prostitution by her new husband? Who hears Salima sold as a baby by her parents into a brothel? And who hears Maria raped repeatedly by her husband in front of her infant son? We need to listen to these women. Unless we do, we will not end violence against women and children. Unless we do, we will design blanket policies, procedures, responses that continue to fail women and children. For these women are the real experts. Women who are ignored, disbelieved, silenced the world over. 43 years ago, just a few miles from here, Refuge opened the world's first safe house for abused women and children. For the first time, women who had been systematically beaten, humiliated, raped and terrorised in their own home had somewhere safe to go, where no one would find them. We've been listening ever since. Refuge is now the UK's largest provider of specialist services. We support 3,000 women and children on any given day in our national network of services, refuges, outreach schemes, specialist advocacy services in police stations, hospitals and courts, culturally specific services from women, for women and children from Vietnamese, South Asian, Eastern European, African and Caribbean backgrounds, and the national free phone 24-hour domestic violence helpline. Our frontline staff are highly trained to listen, to respond appropriately and sensitively, to go at each woman's pace and in her own language. We run award-winning prevention and education campaigns. We train professionals to be able to recognise, respond and reject violence against women in all its forms. And we work very closely with law enforcement agencies to ensure that the perp perpetrators of these crimes are held firmly to account. We speak 30 languages because we need to understand the nuance of what each woman is saying. Because it's the detail that really matters. We have developed such a diverse range of services because there is no one-size-fits-all solution. Every woman and every child experiences violence and abuse in a very different way. Our frontline staff are forbidden from telling any woman what to do, because that's exactly what her abuser did. By asking her what she wants, by putting her in the driving seat, we continue to see that she's better able to turn her life around, free from fear. By listening to her, we understand that some women by, by listening to her, we understood that some women didn't need to go into a refuge. One woman felt safe with her partner in jail, but wanted additional locks on her home in case he got out early. Another needed long-term long specialist support to leave the man who threatened to kill her children if she ever spoke out. Another wanted to report FGM to the police, but only when she knew her younger cousin would be safe in a refuge far away. Another wanted to support a prosecution, but was terrified that her HIV status would be disclosed to her family in court. And another woman just needed someone to talk to, to know that she was not alone and that things would get better. Unless we listen, there's a danger that we focus too closely on the wrong things. We hear the same questions, important questions, but the same questions over and over. Why is the prosecution rate in the UK for FGM so low? Or why, why don't more domestic violence victims report to the police? Or why do traffic women so often defend their traffickers? But what we don't hear nearly enough of is this. Why are you frightened of your uncle? What do you think he might do to you if you try and escape at the airport? Or this. Would your daughter feel more comfortable giving evidence from behind this screen? Or this. Would it help to collect the forensic evidence now in case you want to report the rape later? Would you like me to come with you? Or even this. Could we, help, could we help you find someone to look after your children next Wednesday so you can attend court? It's not complicated, but it's not happening. We all have a duty to listen. Practitioners, policy makers, politicians. If we tailor our every action, every intervention, 
policy response, in short, our entire system around the needs of women and children, then we might start to see real change. Then we can proudly amplify those voices on the global stage and say with real confidence that we can and will end violence against women and children. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much for that very valuable insight. Um, we now want to hear from the World Health Organization, from Dr. Don't get... Merci. In the opening plenary, you heard Flavia Bustreo, our Assistant Director General, articulate WHO's commitment to working in this area. Um, WHO is truly committed in its work. In this brief presentation, I'm going to talk about the needs of child brides and uh, what is being done and what needs to be done to respond to their needs and fulfill their rights. <clears throat> I'm from India. My mother turns 85 this year. Her name is Sharada. Her uh, father, who was an officer in the British Indian Army, named her Sharada um, to acknowledge the Sharada Act, which banned child marriage, an act which was passed in 1929, 85 years old uh, ago. But 47% of girls in India are still married under the age of 18. It was wonderful to hear the Indian High Commissioner talk about the commitments of the new government. And he's right that there's been a decline. But it's been a very, very slow decline. So an estimated 39,000 girls are married every day. That means there are 39,000 child brides every day. While we need to prevent these child marriages, we need to respond to the needs of these child brides. In relation to that, I want to make five points. One, child brides are under pressure to have children almost as soon as they are born. And if they give birth to girls, they're often under pressure to have another child again and again till they produce a boy. This is in many cultures where there's son preference. Child brides face sexual and reproductive health problems, nutrition problems. They are at greater risk of violence and abuse. This is on health. They're also at risk of social problems. Often they're planted in foreign communities, cut away from natal networks, and they're kept isolated from the community and withdrawn from education. So a huge challenge, a huge set of health and social needs. Second, the second point is child brides are not generally not me, uh, um, contacted by programs either for adults or for adolescents. Somehow they fall through the cracks. Adolescent health programming, such as sexuality education programs in schools where they exist, and youth-friendly health services, again, where they exist, barely reach this group. And they are, they are sometimes reached by adult, adult programming when they are pregnant and they come for maternal health care, but they often fall through the cracks. So that's another issue. They have needs, and these needs are not being met by current programs or projects. My third point is there are fledgling initiatives underway in Ethiopia, in India, in Nepal, to try to meet this need, to fill this gap. The Meseret Hivoth project in Ethiopia is a program to reach girls. There are outreach programs house-to-house -house programs to go and engage gatekeepers, mothers-in-law, husbands, to permit these girls to join support groups which meet two or three times a week, where girls are educated, they are taught about what their rights are, and how to negotiate these rights with family members. There's a complementary program called the Addis Birhan program for the husbands of child brides. So these programs bring these men together and they encourage them to support their wives in seeking health care and in supporting them at home, giving them respect, showing them that, you know, with love, you can actually get a lot out of a relationship, much more than you can through force. In India and in Nepal, 
You have programs, first time parents project, a choir project to reach young married couples who are often neglected. Um, through programs, young married couples with contraceptive services and with maternal health services. In South Asia, everyone assumes that as soon as a girl is married, let's not talk to her about contraception because she needs to have a child anyway. Um, but there are slow movements in that direction and projects working in this area. And both in Nepal and in India, these projects have shown that through outreach with girls, with their partners, with gatekeepers such as mothers-in-law, and with the community, you can actually improve access to contraception, increase use of contraception. My fourth point is that we really need to um, incorporate attention to child brides in programs to uh, provide them with health and social services, in programs to tap into community networks, and in, and in programs and in efforts to create supportive relationships for them in the home. My last point is that by responding to the needs of child brides, we don't condone child marriage. We don't um, uh, resign ourselves to another 85 years of child marriage. But we actually have to respond to these girls in order to fulfill their rights. As we've seen in the HIV field and in many other fields, involving people in identifying and solving their own problems and can, is the best way to make them champions, as uh, our opening speaker said, to, in champions in trying to challenge and change social norms in their communities. So to wrap up, there's a, child brides have a huge health and social need their needs are not being met by current programs. There are fledgling initiatives underway, but these are time-limited, small-scale projects, projects which have shown promise, but projects which have a limited time span and a very small reach. We need to expand um, these kinds of efforts into large-scale programs for which monies are becoming available. And never in, the, in our work in this um, are we condoning uh, child marriage. While, while these efforts to respond to brides needs to go on, we need to fight to, to end child marriage and um, to use and to work with child brides to empower them to take charge of their lives, but also to make them change agents in the community. Happy to talk to any of you after, um, afterwards in the se uh, to discuss how we might collaborate in this. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. And um, we will hopefully get time uh, to ha have a few questions from the floor as well um, after we've heard from our next speaker, Jasvinda Sanghira, who, of course, uh, is running the fantastic Karma Nirvana National Helpline, which is dedicated for victims of forced marriage and honour-based violence. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for being in this group and coming to listen to me. And also, I'd just like to point out that I am joined here by survivors in the room there, um, who are just like me. I was born in Britain. My father came from India, rural Punjab in the late 50s. He settled here. He brought with him his belief, value systems, his traditions, all the wonderful things about my background, which is Punjabi, Sikh, all that, and embraced that. But one of the things where the challenge was for me and my sisters was the fact that I watched the majority of my sisters 35 years ago being taken out of British schools to marry men they had only ever met in photographs. They were 15 years old. They would disappear one by one, and nobody ever questioned their absences. It's debatable whether those absences are questioned today. We are in the summer holidays, and this is the most at-risk time for children and young people. There will be thousands, and I'm not exaggerating, of British-born subjects that are going through our airports who will be taken abroad, engaged, or forced into a marriage. The question is, will we have noticed them? And will we notice them in September when schools open and they are now somebody's wife? Or they haven't come back? There's a big question mark over that at the present moment here in the UK. I was 14 years old when my mother sat me down and she presented me with a photograph of a man I was to learn I was promised to from the age of eight. And I was the one who said, no, 
I'm not marrying a stranger. I was born here. I want to go to school. I want to do my exams. Dare I say, have aspirations. Because one of the things people haven't touched on, I note myself within this event, is the issue of honor. It is dishonorable to say no to your arranged marriage. We were brought up to believe that normal adolescent teenage behavior is dishonorable. And it is so dishonorable that we will deal with you for being the normal kid who wants to social network, wear makeup, go out with their mates, etc., by quickly marrying you off because of the shame of that behavior. This is the very important thing that we all have to have regard for. Saying no meant my family took me out of education. I was 15 and a half. I was held a prisoner in my own home. I became invisible to the school system because nobody asked any questions. And parents have a lot of power. So I'm sure my parents would have given the Oscar winning performance of she's not in school for whatever reason. They were believed, not the victim. I ran away from home when I was 16 years old to make the point I was not marrying a stranger. And subsequently, my family disowned me. I have been disowned for 35 years by my family. That means they do not speak to you. These victims face disownment. The survivors I'm with today experience disownment as I do. I have three children and a grandchild now. They are also disowned. There's a blank on their mother's side for the decision she made when she was 16. But equally, they have the freedoms. They will not inherit that legacy of abuse. Carmen Havana was born in 1993 as a result of my personal experience, and sadly, my sister Rubina didn't make it. She was taken out of education at 15, forced to marry. She suffered horrific abuse. In the end, in her early 20s, she set herself on fire and she died. So Carmen Havana is there to give voice to an experience that is not understood. We are not treated as victims very often of abuse. Somehow, our abuse gets degraded to something that is different. It's cultural. Oh, you know, isn't it part of what they do, their tradition? That creates a culture of fear amongst professionals to give us the right policing response, the right health response. Otherwise, how else could so many young people go missing from our schools? The point I'm making is, the need for awareness, education is important. We're on a journey, we've been on this journey for 22 years. At Carmen Ivana, we're dealing with over 800 calls a month to a national helpline called the Honor Network Helpline because we are reclaiming the word honor. We're saying to our families, our honor is your shame and you should be ashamed. And also, we are asking the government to ensure that support services are there in terms of helpline, in terms of mandatory training for the police for health for education. All these things will help us to break that myth that this is part of our world and it is something that our families do to us and also help professionals not to respond to this as being different because cultural acceptance does not mean accepting the unacceptable. So I'm one of many. The survivors are here. Their voices are so important to this whole debate. I urge you, whatever you do in terms of awareness campaigns, training, developing services, use their voices because they're the ones who know it, feel it, and live it every single day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jasvinda, for sharing that with us and for what you're doing to make a difference and change things. You really are. You've moved everybody in this room, I can tell. Um, so let's uh, hear from somebody else who's doing something and has been doing a lot for the last 10 years, and that's Dr. Edna, Edna Adan Ismail from Somaliland, who, of course, has been running her hospital in uh, Somaliland for the last 10 years, and she is providing answers and doing things about FGM. Wonderful stuff. Well, thank you all very much, and I'm really very, very happy and proud to be here today. Um, I first came to your country in 1954 as the first Somali girl who won a scholarship to train in Great Britain. I was from British Somaliland Protectorate, a country that had at that time, no schools for girls. It was considered undesirable, unwise, unnecessary to send girls to school because in their view, the question was, what good would come of sending a girl to school? It will only put the wrong ideas 
in her mind. Now, being privileged to have been born to a family where both parents were educated, and my father was the father of healthcare in my country, I was allowed to go to school to neighboring French Somaliland, Djibouti. So when I came here to Britain and I studied nursing, which was my passion, and I followed that up with midwifery, which became an even bigger passion for me, I was trained in institutions in your country where I was delivering women who were giving birth through a normal anatomy that God had created for them and for the birth of their children. Having been a victim myself, I never associated birth complications with what had happened to me at age six. So I had never seen myself from that end, and I would be delivering women in your great hospitals, and I'm proud to mention the Hammersmith Hospital, the Postgraduate Medical School of London, the Lewisham, the West Middlesex. These were institutions that taught me to care for women through pregnancies and childbirth. And then in 1961, I went home as the first qualified nurse midwife. And for the first time in my professional life, I had women on my delivery table with a different anatomy to what I had been accustomed to assisting in the past. And I thought, oh my God, how am I gonna get this baby out? Because that normal passage through which that baby would have come out had been so mutilated, so scarred, so rigid, so obstructed, that the second stage of labor was just not happening as God had intended it to be. That's when my first rebellion happened. I was going to work, getting babies out through a closed door. But you're well brought up. You don't talk about genitals. You don't talk about that part of the body. A lot has been invested in your education. You have been brought up perfectly. You are not the kind of person who speaks about things like that. But then you rebel and you become horrified and you see babies who are brought to you having suffered prolonged labor, who have, their breathing has been delayed, they sustain damage. So this builds up, you don't know when you're gonna explode, you don't know when you're gonna do something about it, you don't even know how you're gonna do something about it, because it's so universal. That one day in 1976, enough was enough. And I picked up a microphone and I spoke about the harmful effects of female circumcision, that's what we called it then. Horrified the audience of 400 women because that kind of a speech had never been done before. And you feel that this is something you had to say 20, 30 years ago. And you don't speak about it in a way to offend, you reason with people and you say, why are we doing this to our girls? Our Islam forbids it. It's contrary to the teachings of Islam. Mm -hmm. And yet we're doing it. It's harmful to their health. And yet we're doing it. It prolongs labor and therefore endangers the lives of their children. So why are we doing it? It may even interfere with their future reproduction because if they have repeated mm -hmm. pelvic inflammatory diseases, they will not be able to conceive. So we are going against their ability to reproduce and bear children. Why are we doing it? And then you give that example of other Islamic 
countries and cultures who have stopped it. Having campaigned against FGM and pioneered that campaign close to 40 years ago, I am proud to see the next generation begin pick up the fight. I remember days when we would come to England, to Great Britain, to speak about FGM, and we would be denied a venue because this was too controversial. And I will thank the anti-slavery uh, organization, society, because they were the only ones who gave us a platform to speak. And then later I joined WHO, and I retired from a long career with WHO when I went home to build my hospital. Now suddenly, I was implementing my own projects, my own ideas, the way I felt I should be doing them. And the first thing that I did was, I, we are the first institution to train nurses and midwives. But I have my pound of flesh. If you wish to be trained in my institution, whether you wish to be a pharmacist or a lab technician or a nurse or a midwife or even a medical student who's coming to practice in my hospital, are you committed to fight FGM? Because if not, go and waste somebody else's time. I'm 76, I have no time to waste. If you're a fighter, I need you. If you're not a fighter, go and be a coward elsewhere. So what do we do? <laughs> We advocate, we campaign insistently and consistently. Don't just give up, throw in the towel, say, oh, I tried everything, it doesn't work. Yeah, Never give up. Now, what do we do in the hospital? Now, imagine you're a, an 11-year-old and you're born with Down syndrome. That already puts a very heavy weight on your shoulders. And this morning, at 7 o'clock or 6 o'clock, your loving mother and grandmothers bring in the circumciser because they think you're unclean and they cut you. Now, you're 11 years old and you're a big, strong girl and you fight and you struggle and you pull away and they hold, I'm sorry it's graphic, but they hold of the genitals and they just slice it off like a slice of bread, taking with them all the external genitalia of that 11-year-old girl. And she bleeds, but they don't bring her to the hospital. Oh, it will stop. Put some sugar on it. Get some herbs on it. Put a little pressure on it. All girls bleed when they're cut. Don't take her to a hospital because they will start questioning the woman who did this. So they're protecting that old woman rather than protecting this child. And at dinner table, at about 9 p.m., they bring her to the hospital, as white as a sheet, almost dead. And we dropped her knives and forks and rushed down in the nick of time, get some blood group. We need to transfuse her. She's A positive. I'm A positive. I don't think I have AIDS. I don't think I have hepatitis. Give her my pint first before we start looking for others. We transfuse her, so at least we get a, give her a little bit of life while we look for more blood. She gets three units of blood pumped into her and pressure before we can even do anything to her. The urethra is gone. External genitalia is gone. Now, she's 11 years old and she's a Down syndrome. And you go out to the mother and you say, why did you do this? How could you do this? And the answer of the mother is, I wanted to cleanse her. Now, a child with a Down syndrome is as clean and as pure as God makes them. We kept her in hospital for two weeks. In addition to her syndrome, she is now incontinent of urine. These are the things we face. Immediate hemorrhage, shock, pain.
pain, death. We experience and see almost on a daily basis retention of urine, infection. We get girls who start their periods, whose flow cannot flow out as, as normally it should. They get pelvic inflammations. We see girls who are getting married, who are obstructed and who need to be opened up before the husband bursts in because he's a man and he's expected to do that. We get women delivering with us, trying to get a baby through a closed door. We get women who are giving birth to children, who be a breach, the body's hanging out, the head is trapped in. These are the horrors that we face in our hospital. And if they survive, many of them end up with an obstetrical fistula. And if you've seen a woman with fistula, you don't want to see a second one ever again. It's the most humiliating, it's the most damaging, complication, dehumanizing condition that can happen to a woman. A woman with a fistula wouldn't be here today. She would be smelling. She would be wet. She would be leaking. She would be ostracized. She would be in a little hut as far away from the family as possible because she smells and she brings this honor to the family. She brings this honor to this family, not the people who caused, made her become like this. We fight it the best way we can. And we will continue to fight it with whatever we have. We have our voices, which is the biggest weapon that we have. We have our brains. We have a commitment from a powerful government that is today on board to say, enough is enough. You have not been able to deal with it. We're going to give you the support to help you deal with it. I congratulate British taxpayers and the British government for taking this initiative. It was long overdue, <laughs> and we welcome it. But the voices must be heard not in beautiful institutions and conference halls. We were in Beijing. Some of you were not even born. We were in New York. We were in Nairobi. We were in Cairo. We were in many, many conferences speaking about this and many other problems. What we need to do is we need to have the commitment and support for the people who are doing things on the ground. It's those grandmothers in the village who need to be approached. It's the mothers who are doing this and because they, they love their children. They're the ones who need to be counseled. They're the ones who need to be taught. Now, finally, my message is for fathers because this little girl has both a mother and a father. And unless fathers come on board as heads of families to say, my daughter will not be cut. And if she is, be ready to, sponsor, to, 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 to shoulder that responsibility. We will not see the end of it. I will share this with anybody who wishes to have it. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. But we must fight it. We must end it. Because if we do not, we would be failing in our responsibilities as responsible adults, as responsible human beings who know better and who are doing nothing about, about it. So thank you for this opportunity, and bless you all. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Ismail, for that inspiring and harrowing I, account. May I recognize someone who's a long pioneer, Daniela Colombo, please raise your hand. Mm -hmm. A woman who's been with us for over 30 years helping us fight FGM. I recognize you and I appreciate your support. Thank you, Daniela. Now I've got to be the bad guy because we're running out of time. So um, Juliet Albert, uh, she runs the Acton African Well Woman Clinic and she's doing some fantastic work uh, to take on the terrible effects that we, we heard about there uh, right now in this country. I can't really follow that, to be honest with you. Um, I'm a specialist FGM midwife and um, there's under 10 of us in the UK uh, so there's a few specialist FGM clinics and um, it's a real privilege actually to work with women who have FGM. Um, 
There are two other specialist FGM midwives in the room, actually. Isa Eden from Ealing and Alison Byrne from Birmingham. And Alison said last week that when we're FGM specialist mid midwives, we uh, live, eat, breathe FGM. And we do. And um, I want to tell you very briefly about our clinic. Um, it's a little bit different um, because the clinics that exist at the moment in the UK tend to be hospital-based clinics that uh, see pregnant women. So those pregnant women, they're coming in uh, because they're pregnant and then it hopefully gets identified that they've got FGM. And it was through my work in the hospital-based clinic that I run um, that we recognised that pregnant women were saying that they'd been in pain for several years um, they'd been suffering terrible pain with their periods, urinary tract infections. They were terrified because they were pregnant and they didn't know what would happen during childbirth. So we thought we really ought to try and target non-pregnant women um, as well as caring for pregnant women. And um, we now see, I'd say, 200 pregnant women a year and about 100 non-pregnant women a year approximately in our clinics. Um, so I run two separate clinics. And the community-based clinic, what we did was we thought we'd try and do something a bit different to reach out to women. Because some of the women we see, they don't speak English. They don't read English. We have a large Somali population in our area. Sometimes they don't read Somali either. So we thought it might be a good idea to make an advert for Somali TV um, to tell them about our clinic. We also... Um, made sure we have a specialist health advocate and we also have a psychosexual counsellor and the women we see are some of them are terribly terribly traumatized um, they will cry from the minute they walk through the door till the minute they leave and some of them want to know what they've had done to them and they use the word i just want to be normal like everyone else sometimes they have a very severe type of fgm and they need to actually be opened um, and I think what's happening in the UK is that some of these women, they may have um, come to the UK age seven or eight. They may have been here 15, 20 years. They're just as English as all of us. And, um, but if they were in Africa on their wedding night, they might have a mother or a mother-in-law cut them open or the man might force himself to open them. And that service doesn't exist in the UK. And what we found was we were getting, literally we've had over a thousand phone calls from women saying, I'm getting married next week, I need to be open, can you help? Or I got married two weeks ago. And so it's really important that our services fast track women. We don't want women on waiting lists for six months because they've got the courage to come and, and access help. And then if you leave them to wait six months, they're going to be having false penetrative sex. Um, we found that women don't want to go to a male GP. It's so sensitive. Can you imagine going to your GP and having to talk about things like that when you've never, ever spoken about it to anyone before? So women can self-refer. They can ring us up. They text us. Um, we've bypassed the, the GP referral system. And um, those are just some of the things. By having a, a, a clinic that's for women, it's run by women, um, and we're just trying to make it... Um, respond to the demand that's out there we i think it's the tip of the iceberg we see women with complex perineal trauma like um edna's been talking about fistulas they're in pain every day of their lives um, we don't have a fast referral pathway to send these women to specialist uro gynecological services they're waiting six months to see an expert um, we can do so much as specialist midwives but we can't offer them the full holistic support that a lot of them need so um, one other thing I wanted to say is that our little clinic which has been running since 2008 um, and it has been funded by the NHS up till now although every year we were told uh, it's under a particular choosing health budget and we may not get funding for next year and we've just been told that in April we're going to be out to tender so we may not exist at all so I just wanted to show you how we need more resources and more help. I'm supposed to work one day a week on FGM, but it is a full-time job. <laughs> and, um, but we're very, very, we're very lucky to work in this field with these wonderful women. Um, it's an absolute privilege. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you can just see how...
how much you care and how much you believe in what you're doing just by the way that you spoke. It's so moving. Um, so I'd like to uh, now uh, give the last word. Oh, we need to show... Do we have time? I don't think we have time. I'm sorry to be a bad guy. Um, but I think we need to hear... You want to see it? Okay, but due to popular demand, I am a Democrat after all. Let's see the video. Hello, I'm here to tell you about a new service we have for all women. The service is based in Ealing for women with female circumcision. The service is free from the NHS and we can arrange for the reversal procedure to be carried out within two weeks. All information is confidential and we can give any other health, help and advice. Please telephone us on 0208 Thank you. Well done. Okay. It means purified. It, can, it, it encourages it. Yeah. It's good name. Okay. That's the word you should use. Okay. Yeah. Halal means purified, cleansed. This was made in 2007. She says she wanted to use different terms so everybody would understand what she's talking about. Halal is the one we all understand. So we need to. Good Sorry, but can I just. Can we just hear from Doris Bartel? Because she's been waiting. She's come an awful long way. And she's doing some fantastic work in Ethiopia. So, ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Doris Bartel from Care International. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much for inviting me to speak at this really important summit and in this particular panel, which is raising the voices and the opinions and the rights of the survivors and the heroes themselves. So I really appreciate it. And I really love the, my fellow panelists. Thank you all so much for really inspiring and, and challenging uh, words, so thank you. I'm, I would like to share just a few words about the experiences of married adolescent girls. This summit is designed to raise attention to the issue of child marriage and the prevention of marriage before the age of 18. But as Chandra said, so many girls are already married and we should be thinking also about the needs, the rights, the choices of those girls and those adolescents who are already in marriage. I think you know it's it's really a shame to to have as an outcome indicator the 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 mark of the age of 18 at marriage as this as a sign of success because I think the needs the rights the choices of women in marriage are actually the same whether you're 14 or 18 or 40 you know I'd really love to in, increase uh, choices and, and rights within marriage I'm I lead cares gender and empowerment work. I'm based in Washington, D.C., and uh, my issues include the issues of gender-based violence, child and forced marriage, and other uh, gender issues. And our programming focuses on poverty reduction work globally. And uh, I'd like to just share a little bit about the experiences, the successful experiences of working with married adolescent girls in the country of Ethiopia. Chandra gave you a really good intro to the issue of child marriage globally. Thanks, Chandra, with his five key points, which I wrote down. As you know, child marriage is uh, not legal in Ethiopia before the age of 18, uh, but the cultural traditions often prevail. And 41% of married women in Ethiopia say they were married before the age of 18. And in the Amhara region, which Chandra mentioned, it's even higher. 74% of girls are married before the age of 18. I'd like to share some of our experiences at working with those girls through a holistic package with a really a wraparound approach that includes, that puts them at the center, but also includes a lot of community and family support systems for them 
And more, most importantly, these girls say, this is a system that really works, and it works for them. The experiences that we had were from our work there from 2010 to 2013 with 5,000 married adolescent girls. And it, the interventions included sexual and reproductive health information and education, as well as services, peer group support, and economic empowerment. It also included that really important community-based support system for those girls. The girls really mentioned one of the key issues that Chandra said, very socially isolated, very difficult to get out of the house and feel very cut off from their natal families and also from other girls their age. So that peer support system really helped them reach out and talk about the issues that were important to them with other girls and come to some solutions together. And we learned some key lessons from working with married adolescent girls. Uh, we'll say that facilitating the peer education group worked really well, and they said it, they really loved it. Even in a rural, conservative context where mobility issues are very difficult, this, this worked for us. Uh, it worked because the community supported it. Uh, the girls told us that they really valued the reduced isolation and that they loved the reproductive health information and they loved the tailored life skills training and they really appreciated the negotiation skills that they got from the training, which they used with their families and with their husbands. Married girls have very little power or control in their lives and so engaging other adult community members for outreach and support was really key. We found that it helped to work with the influential gatekeepers, as Chandra said, in creating public discussions to change the norms that were affecting, negatively affecting girls. About 180, the, the girls and their communities worked to prevent 180 other child marriages during the time that we worked with them. And without that <coughs> holistic wraparound community-based approach, I don't think that would have been possible. We were partnering with the International Center for Research on Women, which conducted our evaluation, our endline evaluation for this program, and found that reproductive health really increased with a 27% increase in contraceptive use among adolescent girls and improvement in financial skills and savings of their own, which increased by 72%. Girls reported improvements in couple communication and increased participation in their household economic decisions. Girls reported greater self-confidence and decreased domestic violence. Child, child brides are at very high risk for domestic violence, and we were really pleased to see that those rates were going down. One girl said, I believe in myself. I have the skills to cope with problems. I can solve them on my own, which I think really reflects that kind of self-confidence that we were hoping to see. Other girls told us that they were much more likely to be using contraceptives and to talk about child uh, planning for children with their husbands. Another girl told us a cute story. She was taking a picture of her husband who was washing his own feet. She said, this used to be a task that was my job. He works in the fields, his feet get very muddy every day, and it was my job to wash his feet at the end of every day. But now, with the kind of uh, more discussions that we're having at the household level about equality, he sees that my feet are dirty too. I'm working in the fields also, so we wash our own feet. Each of us washes our own feet. It's just a sign that some power dynamics in those households are changing. So just to leave you with the words of, uh, you know, I think uh, married girls are sometimes forgotten in this work on child marriage, so I'd just like to encourage us to think about the voices, the needs, and the rights of married girls as we think about the post-2015 MDG goals and make sure that they're included in that. And we need scalable, scalable models for that. And I really feel like this project and this program was one of those opportunities for learning how to scale up work with all those married adolescent girls. So thank you. We're over time, so I'm going to uh, make a, an executive decision and say we'll, we'll just have a couple of questions, because I'd hate you to miss the opportunity to put any points uh, or ask any questions to the panel. So would anybody like to kick us off? Lady here. Hello, everyone. Um, as Layla said earlier, closer to your mic. Okay. Yes, yeah, sorry. I've never used one before. Um, I'm a survivor too, and um, Leila, I think she has opened the door for people like me to come forward and talk about their own experiences as a seven-year-old. I experienced that when I was seven years old. Now I'm a teacher and she's in a primary school, and the first time I talked about it was a shock. When I finished talking to my colleagues, they couldn't speak for five minutes, and I thought I must have traumatized or done something. But what it was, it was a shock that they've never had it before. They never knew 
it actually existed. They just had the name, but they never knew how it was really. And um, for me, it's two things that we need to do. It's like education. Education is the biggest tool we have. We can educate adults who work with children. We can educate, tell them about what it's, what's FGM and what it does and everything else. And we can also educate the girls themselves. From secondary school, they can handle any information. We are teaching them about sex, um, sex education purely for their own protection. We can do the same as FGM. We can teach them about FGM, give them that tool, tell them what FGM is, explain to them, and tell them where to go for help when they want to do something about their lives. If they are forced to go through the practice, they can go and say, oh, I know what to do. I can call this helpline, this and this, oh, or I can go to my school and explain because there's, there's information that I know already. I've been taught in my school. So if we equip them with that, that will mean that we will reduce FGM significantly, we will. So we need to educate the girls and we need to educate even primary schools because we teach them about their body and how to not to be touched or everything else. We can do the same as FGM, and then we wouldn't have a problem of why is not everybody, no one is gonna ever come forward and say, my mother mutilated to the police. No one is ever gonna do that. But teach them, teach them how to, not to be tampered with their body, just like other sexual abuses, and we will have significant reduction in FGM. We should educate, 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 educate. Do you agree with that? Just, if you don't mind, um, we'll uh, concentrate on getting questions from the floor because I do want people to, to have, a, have their say. Right. I don't know what the floor thinks about this. There are two sides. Uh, one people say when you've got, I run an FGM specialist clinic in Liverpool, that when a lady comes to you, you should report that lady to social services or the police. Do you think it's right to report them to the police? Because I think if they don't, if they come out, if you start reporting to social services, they go underground and you don't hear about it. I think first of all, as professionals, if somebody said to you right now, maybe my daughter might be raped, what would you do as a professional? So you always have to keep in mind, obviously, if you know a child's at risk, you have to report it. That's really fundamentally, that's what it comes down to. But if, if a child's at risk, as a professional, you have to refer that child. You know what, and you hope you're wrong, because, you, because let me tell you, as a survivor, I wish somebody intervened, whether my mother was wrong or right. Because one thing people forget is, I'm not trying to demonize other forms of violences, but with something like FJ, part of your body is taken away. Regardless if my mother gets in prison now or the man who cut me gets imprisoned, I still have that body, part, that body part still missing from me. So I wish somebody intervened. So we need to step away from this idea of, oh, are we going to offend people? Obviously, and you know, as many of us, we work with women and children all the time and we use our instinct. I've seen where women have said to me, oh, no, I'm not going to do FGM tomorrow, but I knew she was going to do it. Do you understand? But as a professional, my role is to protect the child. And if, if you're wrong, then at least you did the prevention. But obviously, as a professional, you take the opportunity to educate the mother. And let me tell you, 99.9% .9 of the women who came to come to my clinic, they don't want FGM. They just want to be given the right information. As Hiva said, people need education. Because a lot of these women don't know how their bodies work. So it's... You just have to, the, your aim has to be protecting the child, full stop. Okay, I'm terribly sorry, um, but um, Sharina, who's very, very strict, you don't want to cross her, I'm telling you, um, has said we've got to wind up. I'm really, really sorry about that because I think, you know, we've got so much to discuss. But I think it is fitting that uh, Layla finished the session. It's been an absolute honour and a fantastic insight to hear from every one of this illustrious panel who are doing something. They really are changing the world. And in the words of Dr. Ismail, together we really can and we have a responsibility to change this world and we will. Thanks very much. Thank you.